Okay. So uh, in the last class, we looked at uh, Schwarzschild solution and we studied it in various uh, different coordinate systems, uh, including the original Schwarzschild coordinate system. Uh, then we transformed it to tortoise coordinates. From there, we went to Eddington Finkelstein coordinates, whether they were ingoing or outgoing uh, coordinate system. Uh, and finally, we uh, wrote the metric in terms of uh, the crystal coordinates, uh, which covers all possible extensions of the Schwarzschild geometry, uh, where original Schwarzschild geometry was, of course, well behaved only for values of rho, which, are, which were greater than 2 gm. But uh, we could extend that to rho equals 0 in the case of uh, Eddington Finkelstein coordinate system, and we could show that rho equals 2 gm was nothing special. And uh, in the crystal coordinate system, we actually did a complete extension, wrote it in terms of light cone coordinates, and we showed that in the crystal coordinates, the horizon is naturally uh, the null direction, and uh, rho equals 0, which is the uh, curvature singularity, uh, is. Uh, uh, corresponds to hyperbola, which is covered by the asymptotes, which are the horizon. Uh, equal time uh, equal time surfaces were kind of uh, planes or in two dimensional picture, they were lines going through the origin <coughs> and um, equal row surfaces generically were hyperbolic. Okay, now what we want to do today is a little different from what uh, we did uh, in the last class, although uh, these results are applicable and useful in black hole physics, particularly uh, when one wants to study uh, quantum physics of the system, uh, although the con energy conditions that we will be talking about are essentially classical conditions, and we would uh, also briefly talk about how uh, the quantum theory affects these kind of conditions. Mm. The energy conditions are also useful when one studies cosmology uh, and uh, mm, in cosmology there are various scenarios. One of the important uh, uh, proposals is what is called inflation in which uh, one tends to violate various energy conditions and, uh, uh, and allow uh, the <coughs> allow the uh, space or metric to expand exponentially. Uh, and But to understand all that, we need to understand what energy conditions are. And so let's uh, do that today. Okay. So uh, we, we, of course, wanted to look at energy conditions kind of from the point of view of geodesic congruences, although not so much in the cosmology picture, but more in the black hole picture, really, uh, our generic uh, space-time picture. Uh, and uh, to do that, uh, we will start with energy conditions. Okay. Now, uh, we know that the Einstein equation generically uh, in the presence of matter would be written as, as G mu nu, which is Einstein tensor is equal to 8 pi G Newton times uh, T mu nu. And where T mu nu is the energy momentum tensor of the matter uh, occupying the uh, space time for which G mu nu is the curvature ten, uh, Einstein tensor. Okay. So, of course, if you want to solve an equation like this, of course, G mu nu itself is a very complicated uh, tensor. It involves uh, uh, rich tensor and rich scalar, and rich tensor and scalar are written in terms of metric and its inverses and their derivatives, as, which makes this equation quite uh, non trivial, non linear, and coupled. Uh, in, even in the absence of T mu nu. But when you have T mu nu on the right-hand side of the equation, then this equation is not only non-linear coupled uh, differential equation, partial differential equation, but it's also inhomogeneous because the right-hand side is nothing to which T mu nu itself. Uh, so the problems could do get complicated, but in typically in general relativity, we expect the stress tensor to satisfy certain conditions. And subject to those conditions, one may be able to solve certain uh, problems that are at hand. Okay, uh, so the kind of condition that one would want to kind of demand or expect uh, 
uh, in the human to density to satisfy are something like that uh, the energy density should be positive or uh, the energy density should dominate uh, should dominate compared to say the pressure okay so these are the kind of conditions that one would be kind of thinking about and we want to understand as to what kind of conditions that we could put in and how do we classify these conditions and okay now depending upon the problem at hand we would be using one energy condition or other and uh, some of those conditions would be obvious from their name itself as to what we are trying to do okay now since these conditions basically impose constraints on the energy of the uh, of the system uh, they are typically called energy conditions okay so to impose or to understand what these energy conditions are uh, let's assume that the stress tensor can be written in this particular form okay so t mu nu is the stress tensor uh, and it is written as rho e0 mu times e0 nu plus p1 e1 mu times e1 nu plus p2 e2 mu times e2 nu plus p3 e3 mu times e3 nu okay then e mu alpha alpha taking value 0 1 2 3 are, are basically orthonormal bases in the space mu nu are of course the curved indices <coughs> mu nu are of course uh, the curved space indices and alpha is an index which is the local flat uh, coordinate index so uh, e mu uh, alpha are basically form orthonormal basis uh, remember it is not just orthogonal but it's also normalized orthonormal basis such that g mu nu e mu e nu is just one or minus one depending upon what are the values of alpha beta if alpha beta are zero then they are just minus one if alpha beta are one two three then they are just plus one okay right so e mu uh, alpha are not constant quantity they are functions of space time okay simply because eta alpha beta is a constant g mu nu is arbitrary curved matrix so this product naturally tells you that e mu alpha e mu beta better be functions of space time so that g mu nu multiplying them gives you a constant okay so so when we say they are also normal basis they are not just some simple uh, numerical entries okay so so this is not a very drastic assumption if you really look at it uh, carefully although it is written in terms of four quantities e, uh, rho p1 p2 p3 uh, you may think that like you know uh, that t mu is restricted quite a lot by doing this but that's not really true because uh, e mu e nu can be complicated uh, functions and therefore you know this representation uh, can give you several non-trivial components uh, of t mu nu uh, by, by representing it in this fashion okay to put it little differently you can think of this equation as an eigenvalue equation uh, or other or, or, or other diagonalization of t mu nu and you can think of rho p1 p2 p3 as eigenvalues of t mu nu which t mu nu uh, as you know is a symmetric tensor and if you diagonalize this using e mu alpha, then e mu alpha are basically uh, eigenvectors of t mu nu. Okay, so you can think of e mu alpha as eigenvectors and rho p1, p2, p3 as eigenvalues. Okay, <coughs> we usually call rho to be the energy density and pi are typ typically referred to as principal pressures. Okay. Yeah, and this is what I was just uh, saying that rho and pi are eigenvalues of the stress tensor and e mu alpha are the normalized eigenvectors. Okay. So, uh, using of course these eigenvectors, we can also invert this equation and write down g mu nu inverse, okay, and in terms of these e's in this particular fashion, g mu nu inverse is equal to eta alpha beta uh, contravariant uh, tensor times e mu alpha e mu beta okay so this is in some sense the kind of what's called the completeness relation uh, which just means that 
in your alpha forms a complete basis such that you are able to invert this relation. If it does not form a complete basis, then you won't be able to invert. So, so in that sense, this equation is typically referred to as a completeness relations for in your alpha. Okay, so let's suppose we are looking at what's called a perfect fluid. Okay, so perfect fluid is an object um, where the pressure um, or the principal pressures P1, P2, P3 are all equal. Okay, uh, so in that case, you can write down T mu nu as rho uh, times E0 mu E0 nu plus P times E1 mu E1 nu plus E2 mu E2 nu plus E3 mu E3 nu. Now, remember that if you look at this expression, um, then you realize that, uh, or maybe um, this equation, then E1 mu E2, uh, E1 mu E2 mu E2 mu are the quantities that you would get if you put alpha beta is equal to 1, uh, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3. Okay. You, know, you would get G mu nu if you also allow alpha beta to be 0, 0. So what you could do is that you could add and subtract E00 to that and you can write down this entire expression as G mu nu plus E0 mu E0 nu, okay, which is basically added and subtracted piece. When you uh, add one piece and subtract, then that piece will be subtracted term plus this gives you G mu nu. Okay, so now you can rearrange because this E0 mu E0 nu can be added out here and you can write down T mu nu to be rho plus P times E0 mu e0 nu plus p times t mu nu. <coughs> okay, so for a, for a perfect fluid, um, the energy momentum tensor would take a form rho plus p times e0 mu e0 nu plus p times g mu nu. Okay, and once you do that, then from here you can actually identify e0 mu as the force velocity of the fluid. Okay, so, so you can just think of is this as the uh, as the full velocity of the perfect fluid. Okay. Fine. So this is how the energy momentum tensor for a perfect fluid would look like. Okay. Now what we really want to do is to consider energy conditions for generic energy momentum tensor, not for not necessarily for, for the perfect fluid. <coughs> okay. Now of course if you can do it for generic uh, energy momentum tensor, you can always specialize that to perfect fluid and obtain the corresponding conditions for the um, for the perfect fluid. Okay. So, given the fact that the perfect fluid tells you that E0 mu, E0 mu can be thought of as uh, velocity for vector for the perfect fluid, we could try to write down the energy conditions uh, in terms of uh, velocity vectors uh, of specific kind. Okay. So, one of the kind of thing that we could look at is look at a time like vector. Okay. Uh, let's call it V mu, and we want to look at uh, this uh, time-like vector as something which is um, which represents the full velocity of an arbitrary observer in space-time. Okay, so anytime you want to measure, say, energy of uh, of this uh, system, say, uh, suppose there is some matter or there is some uh, object sitting around, you want to measure the energy of that thing. It is measured by some observer and it is measured relative to the velocity of that observer. So, velocity of the uh, observer is intrinsically tied with these kind of measurements. Okay, so uh, typically, if you are looking at a, an observer which is massive, it would be following some kind of a time like trajectory, and therefore, a tangent to that time like trajectory would be a natural time like vector that you would want to uh, consider, which itself, which is a kind of instantaneous for velocity of that observer. Okay. Now, uh, we of course want to look at future directed uh, time like vectors. So that is something which I did not mention here explicitly, but it is, uh, maybe I mentioned it below. Yeah, it's right there. Um, but it's kind of uh, implicit in this. But anyway, we, we will see it in a moment. Okay. So what we could do is that we could decompose this uh, time like vector in terms of this basis that we have defined E mu alpha. Okay, and you can write that as gamma times E mu zero plus some A times E mu one plus B times E mu two plus C times E mu three. 
where A, B, C are not numbers, but there are some functions such that so that V mu is writable in terms of uh, these basis vectors. Remember the basis vectors themselves are functions, but A, B, C are also functions, so that arbitrary V mu, arbitrary time like uh, velocity vector is writable in this particular form. Gamma is has a property that it is written as one over square root of one minus A squared minus B squared minus C squared, okay? And we have chosen a plus sign here. That is what this comment is that we are looking at future directed uh, time like vector uh, and normalized vector. Uh, so, therefore, we normalize by putting a gamma out here. And that gamma is written in this particular fashion. And we have chosen positive sign, which is a statement that we know is a future directed uh, time like vector. If it was past directed, we would have picked up a minus sign. Okay. And uh, the fact that this vector is time-like, okay, corresponds to the following constraint that, uh, that this square root is positive, which just tells you that a squared plus b squared plus c squared is less than one, okay? And, um, okay. And, uh, but besides that, a, b, c are uh, not restricted, they are arbitrary functions, okay? Subject of this condition that is called this plus is called this. Okay, uh, so this is what is called a future directed normalized uh, time like vector. That's what PMU would be referred to as. Uh, let's do one more thing. Let's have a future directed null vector. Let's call it KMU. And this KMU is, can also be written in a similar fashion as e0 mu plus a prime e1 mu plus b prime e2 mu plus c prime e3 mu. Okay, now notice that there is no normalization sitting around here, unlike the time-like vector, and we know why. Uh, the time-like vector has finite norm, okay, it takes some v mu, v mu is equal to some negative number, okay, uh, and that is a negative number simply because our choice of metric is minus plus plus plus, so that's why time like would be a negative quantity, okay. But if you're looking at a null vector, then k mu, k mu, or k, k mu, k mu, g mu, nu would be just zero. And in, if it is zero, then there's the arbitrariness in the normalization, and therefore you usually do not normalize such vectors, okay. So therefore, there is no gamma sitting around out here, but you do have a prime, b prime, c prime, which are arbitrary functions, exactly the way a, b, c were arbitrary functions, and e mu alpha are of course the fixed basis vectors corresponding to a geometry that we are looking at, namely the one which is given by g mu nu as a, as a space-time metric for the cloud space. Okay. Fine. Now, because the space, because this vector is null, uh, we know that k mu k nu times g mu nu would be zero, and that is for this parameter that tells us that a one prime squared plus b one prime, sorry a prime squared plus b prime squared plus c prime squared should be equal to what? Okay, so so these are arbitrary vectors subject to of course this condition. Okay, this is equality where this is inequality. So these are arbitrary functions. Okay, but they are not completely constrained. I mean, like the only constraint is that the square should be less than one. Whereas this one is a much stronger constraint that the squares, sum of squares should be exactly one. Okay. Okay, so let's try to look at the first energy condition. Okay. And that is what is referred to as the weak energy condition. The weak energy condition states that the energy density of any matter distribution must be non-negative. Okay, as seen by any observer in space time. So you have any observer, observer that you're looking at. So we're assuming that that observer would have a four velocity, which is like a time-like vector. Okay, then uh, we can write down kind of four velocity vector corresponding to the observer as V mu. Okay, and the fact that the the energy density of the matter distribution is non-negative implies that T mu nu, B mu V nu, which is the energy density, 
uh, as seen by the observer, okay, is positive semi-definite. Okay, that means it is not negative. It can be zero or positive. Okay. Now, of course, this is a statement for any future directed time like uh, vector v mu. Okay. So now, of course, if you want to understand what this condition corresponds to, all we have to do is kind of substitute v mu in this particular form, okay, and use the fact that E is normalized, okay, is orthonormal, sorry, okay. So this orthonormality condition is important, and what we will do is basically uh, we will use that orthonormality condition out here, okay. So we first substitute v mu. Uh, in this particular form, we have a gamma squared times E0 mu plus A E1 mu plus B2 mu plus C3 mu and similarly for mu, okay. And then orthogonality uh, of E tells you that you have uh, E0 mu going with E0 nu only, okay, and not with any E1, E2 or E3. Okay, so therefore there are no cross terms between them because of, of, of orthogonality. And once you get that, then you get answer one simply because they are also normal actually. Okay, so if you do that, you can check, it's a few line, well, couple of line calculation to see that T mu nu, V mu V nu, uh, greater than or equal to zero equation will just become rho times A squared P1 plus B squared P2 plus C squared P3 greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Now remember A, B, C were arbitrary subject to only this condition. Okay. That A squared plus B squared plus C squared is less than 1. Okay. So you could choose whatever we, we want. So, <clears throat> so let's suppose that A, B and C are all 0. Okay. If A, B, C is 0, okay, in this equation, then these vectors just drop out and your time like vector is just E0 uh, mu. And that is definitely uh, time like, uh, satisfied that it is time like uh, vector. Okay, so therefore, uh, the time like condition on V mu eminently allows us to set all A, B, and C equals zero. Okay, so suppose you choose a vector like that. Okay, then now remember this condition is true for arbitrary value of A, B, and C. There is no condition on that so, except the condition that A squared plus B squared plus C squared is less than one. Okay, so given that it is true for arbitrary value, it should be true for say equals b equals c equals zero. But if you set that to zero, then you get rho to be greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so what we find is that if we impose weak energy condition, then the first condition that you encounter is that the energy density rho should be positive semi definite. Okay, now we could do something else. You know, instead of setting all three of them to zero, so you set two of them to zero. Okay. If you do that, then you get rho plus a squared p1 greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Now remember, if b equal to c equals to zero, then a squared is less than one because a squared plus b squared plus c squared was less than one. Okay. So that tells you that rho plus a squared p1 greater than zero implies that rho plus p1. Okay, is definitely greater than zero. Okay, it's not a greater than or equal to condition, but greater than condition. Okay, so therefore, uh, what we find is that besides rho greater than or equal to zero condition, we find rho plus p1 greater than zero condition. Okay, now of course, nothing special about setting a not equal to zero and b equals c equals zero. You could have set b equals not equal to zero and a and c equals zero, and then it will be just replaced by rho plus p1 would be replaced by rho plus p2 and so on. So you get generically an equation which is rho plus pi for any i, 1, 2, 3, greater than 0. Okay. <clears throat> Fine. So therefore the final form of the weak energy condition would be that the energy density is positive semi-definite. That's one condition. And second condition is that rho plus pi for i, <clears throat> 1, 2, 3, uh, is greater than zero. Okay, notice one thing, one is a kind of exact inequality, whereas the uh, other one is a condition where it could be zero also. Okay, rho is greater than or equal to zero. 
Okay, so this is what is classified as the weak energy condition. Okay, and it's called weak energy condition because you put only one kind of, uh, constraint and you just say that the energy density of the matter distribution should be non negative. Okay. Fine. So next thing that we could do is to impose what's called a null energy condition. Now remember, for the weak energy condition, what we did was we used the poor velocity vector, which was a future directed time like vector. Okay. Now null energy condition automatically tells you that what you we would be doing is doing the same stuff that we did with the weak energy condition. Okay. Except that instead of having the uh, future directed uh, time like vector v mu we would have future directed null vector, okay? So, but of course, barring that, there is no condition. So in other words, the null vector is an arbitrary future directed null vector, okay? Fine, so in that case, our null energy condition becomes t mu nu, k mu, k nu greater than or equal to zero. Contrast that with this equation, t mu nu, v mu, v nu equals zero, okay? So in some sense, Formally, there is no change except that instead of using time like um, vectors, we are going to use uh, null vectors. Okay. So, this condition T mu nu, k mu, k nu greater than or equal to zero is typically referred to as the null energy condition. Okay. Now, remember that we had written k is also in terms of e. Okay, E0 mu plus A prime E1 mu plus B prime E2 mu plus C prime E3 mu. So what we could do is that we could use this uh, relation and write down the null energy condition in terms of E's. Okay. <clears throat> so again, it's kind of a straightforward exercise simply because of the orthogonality of E's to check that the null energy condition T mu nu, K mu, K nu, greater than or equal to zero just translates into a equation rho plus a prime squared times p1 plus b prime squared times p2 plus c prime squared times p3 greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Fine. So like what we did last time, we could choose uh, various conditions. Okay. So one of the conditions that we could choose is to set b prime and c prime equal to zero. Notice that we cannot set uh, a prime, b prime, and c prime equals zero because of because the vector is null. Okay, so therefore, what we need to do is kind of set only. What we could do is set at best two out of these three guys to zero, and if you do that, then the third guy better be one. Okay, uh, so which is a, which is a condition coming from the fact that the vector is null. Okay. So here's the uh, situation, b prime, c prime equals uh, zero, a prime is equal to one. And in that case, this equation reduces to rho plus p1 greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Nothing very special about a prime, we have done it with b prime or c prime. And therefore, uh, we would have similar equations, but p1 is replaced by p2 or p3. Okay. And that is also part of the null energy condition. Okay. So therefore, eventually what we get is that the null energy condition is rho plus pi greater than or equal to zero for any i. Okay, i is equal to one, two, or three. Okay. So notice that the null energy condition uh, is kind of uh, something which you could uh, uh, see can be derived from the weak energy condition. Because Big energy condition says rho greater than or equal to zero and rho plus pi uh, greater than zero. Okay, so if the weak energy condition is satisfied, the energy condition is automatically satisfied. Okay, so the converse is not true clearly because rho plus pi can be equal to zero in the null energy condition, which clearly C doesn't exist for the weak energy condition. Okay, so therefore, <coughs> uh, weak energy condition implies null energy condition. Okay, and therefore, if some, some matter distribution satisfies weak energy condition, there is no need for you to check the validity of null energy condition. But if it does, well, uh, but if it satisfies null energy condition, okay, that does not guarantee that weak energy condition would necessarily be satisfied. 
Okay. Is that okay? Sir, yes. this is with respect to an observer. Yes, right. So, uh, the, the, so the, in the case yeah. of null energy condition, yeah. So that has to be like uh, light or something like that. That is right. So null energy condition is uh, kind of uh, put in with respect to massless objects. Yeah. Okay. So if you are kind of sending in light. Then you would demand that the matter satisfies the energy condition. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing that we could impose is what is called the strong energy condition. And strong energy condition states that T mu nu minus half T times T mu nu contracted with V mu V nu is greater than or equal to zero. Well, V mu V nu is are our usual suspects, namely yeah, future directed normalized time like vectors. Okay, so so this condition, if you really kind of think about it for a moment, you will realize that it's not a condition about energy moment of tensor at all, because t mu nu minus half t times g mu nu is what what you would encounter when you write down what is called the trace reversed Einstein equation. Uh, I don't remember whether I have talked about this in. Uh, when we derive the Einstein equation. But what you could do is that you can take the trace of the Einstein equation and then you find that the trace of the energy momentum tensor is proportional to the Ricci tensor. And therefore, you can replace Ricci tensor in terms of the trace of the energy momentum tensor, which I have called T here. Okay, And then you can bring <coughs> that term on the right hand side keep the Ricci scalar on the left hand side. And what you find is that T mu nu minus half times T times G mu nu is just one over eight pi G times the Ricci tensor. Okay. So this strong energy condition is therefore really a condition on the components of Ricci tensor. Okay, because this entire expression is just R mu nu. One over eight pi G Newton is not doing anything interesting. It is kind of just so number sitting around so you can forget about that as far as these conditions are concerned so what we find is that r mu nu times v mu v nu should be determined to see okay so in some sense strong energy condition is not so much of a statement about the energy um, of the matter distribution or energy condition for the matter distribution it's more about the uh, statement about the components of the tensor itself Right. Now, given that this equation is written in this particular fashion, we could reverse this equation a bit. Okay, remember g mu nu v mu v nu. This part is just a number. Okay, because of the completeness condition. Uh, here. Okay. Remember v mu v nu is written in terms of e's. And G mu nu with ease would give just numbers. Okay, so therefore, therefore, G mu nu v mu v nu can be kind of uh, written uh, in terms of some uh, numerical quantities. Okay, and therefore, you could kind of reverse this statement and say that T mu nu v mu v nu is equal to minus half times t uh, times g mu v mu v mu which is just going to be one really okay so therefore the strong energy condition can also be written in terms of the equation like this t mu v mu v mu is equal to minus half times t okay now remember that this was minus half on the left hand side but even if you take it on the right hand side it is minus half simply because v mu are time like uh, normalized vectors so therefore, g mu nu, v mu v nu, because they are normalized, give, give you answer one, okay? Except the fact that they are time-like, therefore they give the answer minus one. So therefore, g mu nu, v mu v nu would flip a sign here, but when you take it on the right hand side again, you get a big over that side, okay? So what we could do is that we could use this equation to determine what is the condition that the strong energy condition 
condition imposes on the components of energy molecular tensor. Okay. Now, there is another reason for writing it in this particular fashion because T mu nu, V mu V nu has been already written down earlier. Okay. And that was here. Okay, so here T mu nu, mu V nu is written in terms of rho plus A squared P1 plus P squared P2 plus C squared P3. So what we'll do is we'll just substitute that here. So the left hand side <coughs> is just uh, gamma squared, which is a normalization of the vectors, times rho A squared P1 plus P squared P2 plus C squared P3. Okay, whereas the right hand side is half of so minus P1 minus P2 minus P3. Okay. Now, how do we know this? Well, we know this because we have made the initial answers that the energy momentum tensor can be written in the in this particular form. Rho P1, P2, P3 are the uh, eigenvalues of T mu nu. And uh, if you try to take a trace, then it's just the sum of the eigenvalues. Okay. Only difference between uh, the ordinary matrix versus T mu nu is that when you take the sum of the eigenvalues, you have to put the sign out here. Okay, because that's the time length. Okay, so you get minus rho plus p1 plus p2 plus p3, which is what we are going to plug in out here into this equation for the strong energy condition. Okay, uh, and the sign is reversed simply because of factor of minus, minus half sitting around here, which that minus sign has sort of soft over the sum. Okay, fine. Now, this is a condition that we get, and remember that these are time like vectors, so we can set A, B, C all to equal to zero uh, without, uh, without losing the fact that uh, these are time like vectors. Okay, but if you set A, B, C equals zero, then your gamma is just one. Okay, and if that is the case, then you can check that these terms. A squared P1, B squared P2, they all drop out, okay, and only term on the left hand side is rho, the term on the right hand side is half of rho minus P1 minus P2 minus P3, you can kind of rearrange this equation to get rho plus P1 plus P2 plus P3 greater than zero, so they are equal to zero, okay. Well, as we did in the earlier case, where we were looking at weak energy condition, instead of taking A, B, C, all equal to zero, what we could do is to just take B and C zero, but not A. And if you do that, then you get gamma squared to be one over one minus uh, A squared. And if that's the case, then you can just substitute it up here. Okay, it is one over one minus a squared. We can just take it in the numerator on the other side and massage that equation a bit. Okay, remember we have to set b and c to zero on this side. So that's what we have chosen. But rho plus a squared p1 is there on the left hand side. Gamma squared is pushed on the right hand side and written in terms of one minus a squared multiplied that rho minus p1 minus p2 minus p3. Okay, so once you do that, you can kind of simplify that expression. Okay, so and you find that you get an equation which looks like this. Okay, um, so of which uh, uh, of which like uh, the uh, rho plus p one part of the uh, equation is kind of easy to uh, arrive at. Okay, P2, P3 uh, kind of pieces need to be rearranged by looking at the fact that gamma squared is one minus A squared, and then you give some terms on this side, other terms you kind of push on the left hand side. Okay, now of course, because this is a, a time like vector, A squared is less than one, and uh, that tells, uh, tells you that if you kind of use it into this equation, Rho plus P1 should be greater than zero, which are equal to zero. Okay. Uh, and if you do that, then uh, you will realize that similar things could be done with P not equal to zero and C not equal to zero for P2 and P3. Okay. So therefore, what we find is that in if you impose a strong energy condition, then what you get is rho plus P1 plus P2 plus P3 greater than 
or you put the zero, that was the first condition that you got. Okay. And the other condition is rho plus pi, that's why you put the zero. Okay. Fine. <clears throat> now, one important thing about strong energy condition is that it does not imply the weak energy condition. Okay. Simply because the strong energy condition uh, has rho plus p minus p2 plus p3 return or equal to zero. Okay. And you can. Uh, and immediately you kind of check that you could violate the value of, I mean, you could have a row negative, okay, and you could still kind of satisfy this condition, okay. So, so therefore, the weak energy condition that one we are derived, okay, uh, it does not immediately follow from the strong energy condition, okay. So, so these are the kind of energy conditions that we could uh, put in on the uh, energy volume tensor, weak, null, uh, and strong energy condition. Besides this, we could impose yet another condition, which is called the dominant energy condition. Okay. The dominant energy condition is basically based on the fact that uh, the matter should either flow along the time lag geodesic or along the null geodesic. So, to emphasize this particular point, what one tries to do is to construct a vector uh, starting from a time lag vector and the uh, energy movement tensor. And we demand that this new vector is either time lag or null. Okay. So, T mu nu itself is, of course, the energy movement tensor or stress tensor. Okay. But you multiply that, you contract that with the uh, time like vector v mu. So you have minus t mu nu v mu, v mu, okay? And this, of course, carries a single index mu. And the claim is that this vector is future directed, okay? And either time like or null. Okay, now, it's kind of easy to see that minus t mu nu v nu is a momentum density of the matter uh, as measured by the observer with four velocity v mu. Okay, because it is basically just uh, imagine that like you know if you have a, a observer uh, who is stationary, okay, then v mu would be just v zero. That is only non-vanishing component of the four velocity. All of them special component of the velocity would just vanish. In that case, minus t mu nu v nu would tell you that it is t mu zero v zero. Okay, because that is the only non-vanishing component of the velocity. Okay, and clearly t mu zero is the momentum um, density. Okay, now notice that like t mu zero with the index zero downstairs, when you push it up, would so come on the minus density cut off. Okay, so that's why this quantity is actually the momentum density of the matter. Okay, now of course, we showed that this to be momentum density of the matter in the rest frame of the observer, but clearly that statement is independent of uh, the frame in which the observer is. Okay, so therefore, if the observer is moving, it, this is a covariant way of writing this expression. Okay, fine. Now, the dominant energy condition basically says that this should be future directed time like or null. That means this vector cannot be space like. That is the statement. Okay. So if you want to demand that condition, okay, then we just say that if minus t mu nu v nu is not space like, then it should satisfy the condition, okay, which is that the norm of this vector, okay, should be either zero or negative, okay, because it should be either null or time like, okay, and that gives you a condition like this, rho squared minus a squared p1 plus minus b squared p2, sorry, this should have been minus, minus c squared p3, that's bad, okay, sorry, this is, this is minus n, okay, fine, so, so yeah, so where do we use all these conditions? I mean, we we should have we must have a physical situation in my, in our mind, right? That is right. Yeah. So we will be using them to study, say, 
what happens to the geodesic in curved space or when we are studying kind of effect of the matter on the curvature of space time then we would be using these kind of conditions uh, when we are studying cosmology we may use we, we will need to use these conditions or suppose you are looking studying black hole physics you know and if you have to ask what happens uh, the uh, observer will crosses the um, black hole horizon uh, what uh, happens to uh, that would require studying this as i was mentioning some time ago inflation would violate some of these energy conditions and so on so one needs to check as to under what condition what kind of energy conditions are applicable and use those energy conditions to study the system okay and of course you need to check that those energy conditions are valid throughout the evolution okay now one of the places where these energy conditions well not these but there is something else which i'll define soon uh, is uh, useful is studying the physics of traversable worms for example when you are studying black hole physics then you may if you find that like you know there exists a, a wormhole which tunnels you from one asymptotically flat region to another asymptotically flat region okay uh, without kind of taking you uh, kind of into the black hole singularity now sometimes this such kind of wormholes are not traversable okay that means you cannot kind of you know take a spaceship and kind of tunnel it through that uh wormhole to the other uh, asymptotically flat region but uh, sometimes they are okay you want to ask a question that under what condition solutions of these can exist and whether those uh, conditions are sensible or not okay so uh, right now we are just looking at classical conditions but if you are studying quantum theory then you of course need to ask questions about whether the energy momentum tensor of quantum matter necessarily satisfy these conditions or not okay and as you will see at least in one example we will see that it doesn't okay but so therefore you need to understand how uh, how you would interpret uh, the meaning of these kind of energy conditions when the matter is described by point of physics okay okay so sir this, yeah. also sir this uh, team you know this has energy of both uh, i mean uh, matter coupling to gravity uh, so uh, i have no it has only energy of the matter why is it so when we write this uh, it uh, i mean it comes from uh, uh, the action of matter when we vary it with respect to That's the right. metric yes exactly so so it so, is just because of uh, matter alone uh, yeah, that exactly is exactly. it is energy momentum tensor of matter alone okay 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 gravity sees that as a source okay right like yeah. you, you think of the pauli uh, equation in electrodynamics electrostatics that uh, laplacian acting on phi is equal to rho so rho is a source okay it could be a delta function if it is a point charge or something or it could be a function if it is a distribution of a specific kind okay so the elect electric potential or electric field okay uh, its contribution to the energy uh, ch charge density doesn't exist okay same same thing here that kinetic is the energy density you know, coming from the matter gravity sees that but gravity is not contributing to it okay oh, so sir in gr the yeah. what is energy well in gr the energy is defined for the for the matter okay okay because otherwise there is no clear notion of energy if you take the gravity also into account because delta delta g of the total action uh, is zero because at least on shell right okay 
because delta delta g of the total action is Einstein equation. And if Anshel means if the Einstein equation is satisfied, then that is zero. Right? So yeah. the that means the energy stored in the gravitational field is opposite of the energy stored in the uh, matter. So the, the total energy of these two guys adds up to zero. Okay. Of course, there is a small caveat to that. You may have a cosmological constant and it should contribute a kind of non-zero uh, energy. Uh, because that is not something which is coming either from the matter uh, or from the dynamical part of the gravity. Okay. So when we'll write a Hamiltonian, we'll write it for just for the particle. That is just right. for the matter. So... That is right. Yeah. Okay. So that would be non-zero yeah. and opposite to what gravity has. What opposite to what gravity has exactly. Okay. okay. So it, Okay, so coming back to this uh, uh, dominant energy condition. So because this vector is not space-like, we impose the condition that T mu nu V nu uh, norm has to be uh, zero or negative. Okay, and that gives you this condition. Again, a uh, couple of lines calculation. Uh, our life is simplified simply because E nu i E nu j is equal to delta ij essentially, okay, delta ij times g mu nu really. So because of that, you don't have too many terms contributing. If i is not equal to j, it just does not contribute, you typically get all the type of pieces, okay. This sign unfortunately is wrong, it should be minus, okay. So again, since v is a time-like vector, although t times v is could even be null. V is a time-like vector, so therefore we can set A, B, C equal to zero. And if you do that, then it tells you that rho squared should be greater than or equal to zero because you can just set all these guys to zero. Okay. Right. Now, uh, since minus T mu nu V nu is future directed, okay, uh, we are choosing rho is equal to is greater than zero. Okay, because this telling you rho squared is positive. Okay, doesn't tell you that rho should be positive. But because we are saying that this is not just the uh, not just the time like or null vector, but it is future directed. Okay, and as a result of which the energy density is positive symmetric. Okay, otherwise rho is less than or equal to zero also would have been a solution to this equation. Okay. Okay, let's consider another situation which also we had studied earlier for all time-like vectors, namely set B and C equal to zero, but not A. And if you do that, then you get rho squared greater than or equal to A squared P1 squared. Okay, and we know that for a time-like vector, A should be less than, A squared should be less than one. Okay, and so if you impose that condition, then you find that rho should be greater than or equal to mod of P1. Okay. So that may kind of sound a bit odd because a squared is less than one and rho squared is greater than a squared p1 squared. So how is it that pos that we would impose this condition? The answer is that that this equation is valid for all a's less than one, for all a squared less than one. Okay. So therefore, you can choose a squared arbitrarily close to one, and this condition is still valid. Okay. And therefore, it tells you that rho should be greater than equal to mod of p. Okay. Now, of course, you could choose a to be <coughs> arbitrarily close, a squared to be very close to zero. And in that case, of course, you would find that this condition does not imply this condition. Okay. But the statement that uh, these uh, conditions are, the, the dominant energy condition is trying to make is that this is true for any choice of a. Okay, so including the choice of A, which is, you know, which is arbitrarily close to one. Okay, and if you do that, then because of that possibility of making the choice of A to be arbitrarily close to one, uh, 
this equation tells you the true secret are equal to log p. Okay. <coughs> and uh, there's no surprise now, instead of a, you could keep b non-zero or c non-zero and you'll get p2 and p3, sat p3 satisfying similar equation. Okay. So therefore, what we find is that the dominant energy condition would imply that rho should be greater than zero, okay, as well as rho should be greater than equal to pi, mod of pi, sorry, okay. So that is yet another uh, energy condition that was put in force, okay. Fine. Now the question is, are these conditions necessarily valid all the time, okay? So the answer is that, uh, yes, these conditions are necessarily valid all the time if you are considering classical matter, okay? Because these are the conditions that we impose by hand, okay? And in each case, whenever you impose this condition, the condition is valid for classical matter, okay? However, that's not true if you are studying quantized matter, okay? So, now remember, we are not talking about quantum gravity. We are still talking about quantized matter in in the presence of gravity. So gravity could still be classical, okay? Or gravity could still be just kind of in a fixed curved background, okay? Not even dynamical curved background, but just fixed curved background, okay? Even then, if you're studying quantum field theory, the background of uh, uh, such a uh, curved geometry, okay? You may find that uh, you know, these energy conditions are violated by the quantum matter. And one of the classic examples is what's called the Casimir energy, okay? The Casimir energy is something like this, okay? That you are basically trying to ask what is the energy stored in the cavity compared to the energy stored uh, in, in the entire space time. So what you do is that you put, say, two parallel plates uh, at the distance d from each other, okay? And then you want to ask what are the electromagnetic degrees of freedom store which are kind of living within, within this cavity which, uh, which, are, which is bounded by two conducting plates. And you find that like, you know, those uh, electromagnetic degrees of freedom are quantized because of the finiteness of the system, okay? And they, you can, Think of them as kind of harmonic oscillator type of degrees of freedom, uh, and you can compute the energy corresponding to those degrees of freedom. Okay, now you can remove those conducting plates, and if you consider free space, then free space would have hello, hello, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, you can hear me, right? Okay. So the free space would uh, still have um, continuous spectrum because the electromagnetic uh, wave can have arbitrarily long wavelength. Okay. And you can compute the energy stored in the in those degrees of freedom. That energy is computed by actually integrating over the uh, momentum modes and you can ask what is the difference between the energy, vacuum energy uh, for the electromagnetic field in free space versus the vacuum energy for the electromagnetic field, which is confined to the, uh, to this box of size D, okay? And you find that that difference is negative, okay? This is one of the classic effects in quantum theory and Clearly, this is contradicting what we were talking about. For example, weak energy condition would have demanded that rho square should be greater or equal to zero, and here is a negative number sitting around. Okay, so so clearly you find that although the classical matter satisfies all kinds of uh, energy conditions that we talked about, depending upon how you are studying the system, quantum matter generically uh, violates this type of condition. Now you may think that this Casimir energy is and is our kind of our uh, way of kind of trying to interpret uh, the structure of this end. It may not actually be measurable, but that's not true. In fact, the energy stored or, or 
from that energy. You can complete a force between these two plates. And that force is, you know, is of the order of 10 to the minus 7 or 10 to the minus 8 Newton. And it is eminently measurable and it has been measured. Okay, so it is a measurable quantity and it has been experimentally verified. Okay, so, so clearly the quantum system seems to violate many of these energy conditions, but we could still ask a question as to what is the amount of violation that you have. Clearly you can see that this quantity has a H bar sitting in the numerator, making the total uh, amount of violation a pretty small number, okay? And in fact, what one finds is that, you know, that the quantum effects do allow for local violation of energy condition, but there's a limit on what is the lower limit on, in the negative direction that these violations would lead to in a, in a global system. Okay, that means if you, if you integrate this over the entire space, what is the total value amount of violation? Okay. And because this uh, effect is important, as, <clears throat> as I was uh, saying at some point in the, during the course, uh, that, um, that if you are studying quantum gravity, then you cannot ignore any energy uh, in the system. You know? When you are doing ordinary quantum field theory, say in flat space time or even quantum field theory with fixed curved background, you could ignore the vacuum energy simply because all you really measure is differences between the energy levels. Okay, and therefore the vacuum energy always gets subtracted out. But if you are doing out and out quantum gravity, then even the vacuum energy is important. Okay, and that is the reason why Casimir energy plays an important role if one is trying to ask questions about quantum theory of gravity. Okay. Now, Casimir energy, of course, is important in various other aspects, you know, in things like when you are studying high dimensional theory, theory which are spontaneously compacted by two lower dimensions. Casimir energy is one of the interesting criteria for such spontaneous compactification and so on. Okay. But coming back to the gravity problem, uh, given that there are local violations, but which are limited by you know, amount of global energy condition violation. Okay, what one can do is to not study the energy condition by themselves, but study what are called the average energy conditions. Okay, for example, the average null energy condition is a condition where you write down the T mu nu, K mu, K nu. Okay, and say that the integral of T mu nu, K mu, K nu along the null geodesic, say gamma, okay, this quantity must be non-negative, okay. Now remember, earlier our null energy condition was T mu nu, K mu, K nu itself is non-negative, okay. It, this itself will get our equal to zero, okay. As against the average null energy condition, where you actually integrate along the null geodesic and Locally, the quantity could become negative, but overall, the integral of this object is positive semi-definite, okay? So, instead of imposing these kind of energy conditions that we are defined for the classical system, in quantum system, we generically need to impose conditions which are average energy conditions, okay? And one of the useful ones which is in the current literature, which is important, is what's called the average null energy condition, uh, which plays an important role in the study of traversable wormholes. So, so traversable wormholes are the kind of geometries which connect two causally disconnected parts of the space-time through, uh, uh, through a tube, uh, which is what's called the wormhole, uh, and these this kind of tube is useful for the quantum coherence of the system, but uh, which kind of ensures that the quantities which are far separated are still maintaining the quantum coherence. But um, such wormholes may not be 
may not be useful for physically transporting particles. Okay, so those are called non-traversable wormholes. But uh, if you have wormholes which satisfy the average null energy condition, you know, then typically you would end up getting the uh, the wormholes which are called traversable wormholes. Okay, so so I. Uh, so I'll stop here today and tomorrow, not tomorrow, in the next class we will see how we will use these energy conditions uh, when we study geodesic convergences. Okay. Sir? Yes. Sir, can you talk more about energy in uh, gravity? Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, there is this local 